Hi everyone, I'm Phil Liggett and welcome once more to our coverage of the Paris-Roubaix cycle race. They call it the Queen of the Classic Races and this is the 90th running of the Queen of the Classics. You know everybody will tell you they don't want to ride Paris-Roubaix, but everybody will also tell you they would like to win it. Even the great Bernard Eno won this race once and he did it so he could tell the organisers he'd never ride it again. Well Greg Le Mans has also said he wants to win this classic race. He's won the Tour de France, if he wins this one he'll certainly go down in history. Let's now join the action and see just who does win the famous Harry Roubaix. And so this is the breakaway now. This is Andrea Taffy and he's experienced racing in America. In fact, a couple of years ago he won a couple of stages at the Tour of the Americas when the event started down in Florida. And in this league group as well, Stefan Yoho, Ralph Yerman. And they're now on the entrance to the forest of Arlenberg. So the cobbles in this second section now, because the cobblestones of Paris Bay are split into two large chunks, really. 18 kilometers, about 11 miles of them coming before they enter this section, which is now between Valenciennes and Roubaix. This is the opening now of the last 39 kilometers of cobblestones, some 68 miles still to race, 25 of them over these stones. Well, the forest of Arlenberg, it's normally reserved, particularly for pleasurable walking in the solitude of the woods and on this one day these private roads are open to the bicycle riders in Paris Bay along with following cars normally all motorized vehicles banned from the forest but it looks as though the breakaway is splitting up it was a very strong group indeed it was started in fact by Lielli Yarman uh, the Ariostia team putting three men in the original breakaway of four riders and now that break is splitting up to pieces. There's a chasing group underway as far as we know, it's about 30 seconds back and the main field are heading towards the forest two minutes and 25 seconds down. Now look at this for the crowd. Well the car's having to go over the stones but the riders searching here for the comparative comfort of the mud on the left of our picture. And the pressure on at the front by Ali Ostia. They started this race with a very small field. They were hoping that they would have turned up here with in fact, the number one man, Moreno Argentin, he withdrew just a couple of days before the start. Uh, still a little bit of knee trouble there. And he's left his team now really without a leader. And they put three of them, Marco Lietti, uh, Stefan Yoho and Rolf Yerman in the initial attack group with Roberto Panyan of the Lotus Festina team. Uh, Panyan hasn't done any of the work and yet despite that, the four riders covered the first two hours of riding. They covered 58 miles. And if they keep that sort of schedule up, then they're going to get down to Roubaix in record time. Here's the main field, 2 minutes 25 seconds back and the pressure now going on because the riders always feel when they get to this part of the race although there's still 68 miles to go once they get to the forest of Arlenberg decisions have to be made that is uh, Van Poppel in the lead and Duclo Lazale, Gilbert Duclo Lazale is trying to go across the gap to him this is Eddie Senor, he was in the chase group that was trying to make contact and joining two at the back there is Taffy and number 28 going through, well that is the uh, is uh, in fact Ludwig Williams, so Williams has come up to this group, he wasn't in the initial chase. So that is the MG Malificio team rider, Williams, as we go out to the end now of the Forest of Arlenberg, the crowd here at his thickest, the simple reason being, once they've seen Paris Bay go through the end of the forest, their cars park nearby, they're onto the nearby auto route, and they'll be able to rejoin the race further along, and they'll get there a lot quicker than the riders, because 
As you look at the map for Paris Bay these days, starting at Compiègne, about 50 miles north of Paris, and in fact then goes on a very circuitous route, making its way up to Roubaix. It certainly doesn't go in a straight line anymore. Tail of the peloton passing through the forest. One or two riders now having to hang on at the rear. There's still a very big field here. Sean Kelly has already experienced problems, by the way. He's had one puncture and he's come back up to the field. So too is another winner of the Perry Bay, Eric Van der Laarde. He's back up to the bunch, but they've both been involved in chases. Looking down the line here, Greg Lamond is very close to the front of this peloton. And so too, I can see also there the sunglasses on the eyes of Ludwig, uh, Olaf Ludwig. Olympic champion, and of course this is the Olympic year in Barcelona, but Ludwig now a professional rider and won't be defending the title he won in Seoul four years ago. He's of course riding from East Germany then, and how life has changed for Ludwig over these last few seasons. So the field leaving the forest of Arenberg, 2 minutes 25 seconds behind. Let's go back up then to the leaders. This rider here is Eddie Signor. A new professional, he comes to the Z team with not a great reputation as an amateur, and this is Jan Schur, a new member of the Motorola team, and it's good to see Jan on the attack today. And in this group also, well this is number 28 again, this is Williams, so this is the chase group now settling down. In pursuit of still Ralph Yerman up at the front. And Eddie Signor, well he's more or less a local rider, he comes from Beauvais, to the north of uh, Paris and uh, wanting to show his new colours as a first-year pro. He is a very strong rider indeed, and it might well be that Roger Leger has made a shrewd selection there in bringing him over from the amateur ranks. He rode the World Championships last year, finished sixth in the Team Time Trial Championship, and 11 wins as an amateur. And France really are riding on a high this season. They've produced some good wins already, not least, of course, the great win by Jackie Durand in the Tour de Flanders, and what a runaway win that turned out to be with the longest break in the history of that event and the French young amateurs now really are riding on a high. There he is, Eddie Signor. And Ludwig Williams, well, this sort of course will suit the Belgian. Different style there of the Belgian rider, sitting right forward on the saddle, very short reach indeed. This is Taffy, not an outstanding rider by any manner of means, but an aggressive one. And Thomas Wegmuller, well, just a week after that great long breakaway in the Tour de Flanders where he finished second. He's now at it again here in Paris-Roubaix and he's no stranger either to the long breaks in Paris-Roubaix because a couple of years ago he finished second behind Dirk de Mol after a long, long breakaway of over 220 kilometers. That's about 130 odd miles. Yeah, I'm sure. It's good to see that Motorola's got one man up in this early attack group because they've had some real bad luck this year. This is without doubt Motorola's best team that they've had indeed. And I'm thinking now too of the old 7-Eleven team because this is the best team that the Americans have formed out here in Europe. And paradoxically, they've had no success at all yet. It will come maybe. This, this is the chase group. Now this is interesting. Here's Duclos Lazal, who is working well. He's chosen the fast wheel there in Jean-Paul Van Poppel. And it's interesting to see Van Poppel on the attack. He's a man that likes to wait for the sprint, but he's not waiting today. He may have sent something back in that big bunch that's trying to split the field up. Rick Van Slyke is going forward with them. Another solid Belgian professional with no great list of victories to his credit. The same can't be said, of course, of Duclos Lazal nor Van Poppel, because both riders win and win frequently. In fact, last year, Van Poppel uh, won his 70th race as a professional. He only turned pro in 1985. PDM team will slowly, shortly disappear, I'm afraid, from our view as sponsors. This is the last season of sponsorship for PDM, and the same has to be said too of the other Dutch team, Buckler. They were only in for three years, it's the end of their contract, and they decided they'd reached their target. And that means that Jan Ross, manager of the Buckler team, and of course, the past winner of Perry Bay, is out looking for a new sponsor. Now let's go back to the group here, it's still led by Taffy. And look at this, they're straight on the back, those two, and they're straight through them. They're interestingly trying to break up this lead group now because it looks as though Duclos Lozal is marking everything today. He's come up very late. They went clear in the forest from the peloton. They had to bridge a gap of 2 minutes 25 seconds. And Lozal is marking this attack by Van Poppel. You know, Van Poppel never normally rides so aggressively as this. He normally waits and will go in a small group and try to handle things in a sprint finish. 
and yet today there's still a long way to go. Look at this, Van Poppel trying to go clear now. He's been caught by the, the reaction, but this group is not all here, I don't think. We've got five of them in the lead. And time for, time for some nosh on the way here for Van Poppel. Van Slyke, the Belgian rider. A lot of work being put in by Duclo Lazelle. He really does strive to earn the title, Mr. Pairo Bay. This is the 14th time that Gilbert Duclo Lazelle has attempted the ride from Pairo Bay. He's finished 11. And he could make it 12 today with a bit of luck. The face there of Rick Van Slyke. And this little group is trying to go clear. In fact, they've dropped Taffy. Yarman, I think, has also gone. Willems has gone. And Wegmuller is here. And I'm sorry about the little bit of picture breakup we experienced. It's not a fault with the video. In fact, it is a problem that we will always receive when we go under obstructions because of the signal from the helicopter beam down to our motorcycles, which brings you these pictures, which are, in effect, live. And so the little bit of breakup we will experience, there's nothing we can do about it. It's when we pass under the structure there of the bridge as well. This is the chase group, and that's Rolf Yerman at the back. And so they've lost contact with that lead group, thanks to the attack there of Van Poppel, and quickly followed by Duclo Lazelle. Van Slyke has gone up there as well. And there's our first chance to see the big field. And it is a big field for this stage of Pairo Bay. The cobbles so far, and we've had about 25 kilometers of them, 15 miles of them so far, hasn't really taken its toll on the big field. There's that breakup again, which as I say, we can only apologize for, but it's because of the technicalities of beaming these pictures back to commentary positions. Now, let's follow the route here, because we're looking now for what's left of that group. It was originally 10 riders. We've seen the lead group establish itself. That is one rider dropped from the back, and it looks to me as though it's Motorola, so it's gotta be Jan Schur. Jan Schur, and that's a sad sight, has been dropped from that lead group, which means that Motorola have nobody up there now. Schur is on his own. He'll be picked up by the main field very shortly. There's no doubt about that, because he's not gonna survive up there on his own. There's still a long way to go. The best part of 55 miles still to ride to the finish. And this will be the second group on the road now. So this will be the chase group then, probably of Willems, Taffy, and Ralph Yerman. And it is, and they too have lost contact. That's a tremendous attack, and it must have been uh, that Van Poppel, when he came up with Duclo Lazal, they immediately jumped that group because they must have sensed they weren't going quick enough. They knew exactly the whereabouts of the main field because they just left them over the forest of Arlenberg. So they've immediately sensed that they had to break this group up to get a better working unit. And that's what's happened. This is the lead group now. Van Poppel driving along. Duclo Lazal second. Thomas Wegmuller is in third place. Rick Van Slyke is bringing up the rear. And I don't think, in fact, that Van Slyke is contributing at all to this chase. But Wegmuller must be feeling a bit tired. He's been out there longer than the rest today. We continue to bounce over the cobbles. We're on sector 13 now of the cobbles. Remember that the cobbles start at sector 22 and they count down. The last sector is number one before they head off into the stadium in Roubaix. First three riders off the end of every sector win not only cash prizes, but also a points competition. To find the king of the cobbles, as it were, uh, for the most consistent rider over the cobbles today. And uh, still bouncing happily along here is Ludwig Willems. This will be in the second group. There's Taffy. Solid rider, if not one of the most famous. And this is Ralph Yerman, former champion of Switzerland. And a very strong rider indeed. But the Ariosti are really riding without a leader today. They only started six men. They put three of them in the breakaway in the opening two miles of Peru Bay. The field reforming behind. And the Lotto riders are really quite prominent now. Johan Museo, a star sprinter. It's also a very strong stare over a course like this, and I suppose if anybody started as an outstanding favourite today, it would be Museo. And just look at that long line of riders, and that is an unusual sight in Pairu Bay. Out back to the leaders, Wegmuller putting the pressure on at the front. Duclo Lazalle to the right of the picture behind Wegmuller. Van Poppel riding very, very strongly. One of the best performances I've seen from Jean-Paul. He's a really nice person to know as well, he speaks fluent English and riding strongly, and it looks to me as though they are getting rid of Rolf Yerman here, he's in trouble on the cobbles, and this is the chase group now splitting up as well, because the big field are beginning to wipe out this breakaway, 
and Van Poppel is having none of it. He's keeping going, riding over the center of the cobblestones. This is Willems in trouble as well. Taffy has gone round him, but this chase group has completely disintegrated. Now Willems is a strong rider over cobblestones. Probably best equipped, equipped to actually do something in Paris Bay from this chase group. I'm a bit surprised that he lost contact with the main attack. But he has done so, and it's Taffy who's trying to do something about this chase. But they're losing ground. They're about 40 seconds now behind Duclo de uh, Let's have a look at the main field as they have to do the best they can from down the heart of the big peloton. And hope they don't uh, fall down too many holes between the stones because they're not... They're completely unsighted now behind the riders. Steve Bauer, four or five riders back from the front of that peloton. And Bauer also gets inspired by Paris Roubaix. His last two outings, he's had a fourth last year. And of course, received that very unfortunate decision when he was about a centimeter out of victory when in that photo finish two years ago when Henry Plank had it. Very sad thing, but you know, Steve Bauer hasn't really ridden well for two years now. I think it mystifies him as much as his sponsors. He'd like to get a big result, and he might feel that Paris Roubaix is the day because he has good form. He's been riding well in these spring classics, looking like a man that could pop up with a victory at any moment. Well, Willems is managing just about to control the riding of Andrea Taffy, who's doing all of the work over the section of cobbles here. And he's back onto the wheel of Taffy, but they've got rid of Yerman. Yerman has been dropped by them. Seigneur has gone as well. He has been picked up by the peloton. So too now is Jan Schur. So this original breakaway of 10 has completely disintegrated. We've just got Regnaldo van Slyke van Poppel and Duclo Lazal in the lead. And these two staying together. But I don't think they're going to make any progress now. And one or two official cars slipping through, heading up to see what's happening with the breakaway. And Willems is not helping at all there. He's had his hands full just getting back onto the wheel of Taffy. He's certainly not going to contribute to the pace. And this is the chase now from the main field. They know now that they're going to have to go out and pick up those leaders. They're still only a couple of minutes ahead. Plenty of time to bring them in. Game, we're seeing that it's only one or two riders who are reacting here from the main field and not putting in a concerted chase. PDM, of course, are not going to do anything at all, neither are the Z team. Greg Lamond, Christophe Capel, and Jean Claude Colotti are the Z riders in this league group, and they're certainly not going to contribute to the downfall of their captain on the road, Duclo Lazal, up in the lead. And the Lotto boys, well, I would have thought the Lotto riders will feel they've got the wrong man in that leading group in Van Slyke, and that they would prefer to change it for somebody like Henry Bredant, or indeed Johan Museo. Here we are, alongside Duclo Lazal now. Thomas Wegmuller. Wegmuller, of course, on the same team as Sean Kelly, who rides in a white jersey today as leader of the World Cup competition after that terrific victory he experienced in Milan San Remo. Joint leaders in the World Cup, in fact, but they've given the jersey to Kelly today with Jackie Durant also uh, getting his win in the Tour of Flanders. Each of them now on 50 points in the World Cup competition. And Kelly wearing the leader's jersey. Big Jean Paul. Still willing to take it through. Turn pro, I think it was 1986 when he turned pro, Jean Paul Van Poppel. And he won 15 races in 1987. He did it again in 1988 and 10 wins in 1989 then in 1990 he had a real downer he only picked up two victories and finished way way back in the Tour de France when he should have won lots of stages and last year he found his form again he came back with 12 wins and so far he's also a man of victories this year as well and Thomas Wegmuller here just trying to swallow down a little bit of food a marvellous rider he is, the way he does these long breakaways, he never thinks how far to go, but it's 250 kilometres, 200 kilometres, it doesn't really matter to Wegmuller, he just gets out and sees what shape the race takes, and very often it pays dividends. And this is Gilles de Lyon, 
who's also making an appearance at the front and he was the superboy of a couple of years ago we haven't seen too much of him since and alongside him here Christian Hen a medalist in the Olympic Games four years back he's on the new telecom team revamped this year under their new manager Walter Godefroot himself an outstanding Belgian sprinter and Henny Kuiper the former manager and indeed former winner of Paris Bay well he's now looking after the boys in the Motorola team and there's a lot of attacks coming now on the other side of the road and looks as though Nico Verhoeven is beginning to try and make some headway here but they're on him and in fact that's Van der Nacker who's come to the front and taking a drink there is Edwig van Hooydonk again a little bit of picture break up but this is caused by the a situation around the riders, usually the trees that interfere with the signals that go up from the helicopters and down to the motorbikes and vice versa. There's a real sense of urgency now because they've realised that one or two riders up there could make this Paris Bay right through to the end, Duclos Lazal, and there he is, and Thomas Fregmuller, if Thomas remains or his strength remains with him. And remember, this is coming just seven days after his marvellous performance in the Tour of Flanders, where he was only left behind uh, near the Bosberg climb, a few miles from the finish, and Jackie Durand went on to the victory. They were the two survivors of a breakaway of over 130 miles. And Vegmuller, in fact, looking as though he's struggling a little bit now, as Duclo continues to push the pace, along with Van Poppel. Van Poppel and he really isn't a man that looks for the big long chase like this he prefers the sprint so he must have come out today with a plan in mind and he's got a great ally in Vegmuller and what an amount of work Duclo Lozal is doing every time he goes to the front he pushes on here twice second in Paris Bay he's also finished fourth and sixth tremendous record and they're driving very short turns too. They're giving it full pressure and then sitting up and easing back. And it does seem the only one working in that group is the Belgian Van Slyke. And he would prefer to see now some riders from this group come up. Watching the Motorola boys now, Frankie Andreu. One of only three American riders. The other is Andy Bishop and Greg Lamond, of course. They're the only three American riders in the race. And there's now some semblance of action here as the riders are trying to get this to go. Because you see the teams aren't helping each other. There's Jan Shaw, I think it is, who's now come back into the field. So he's been picked up and he's now doing his turn at the front to try and reduce this gap. Neutral service coming through, but a little word of advice, I think. Possibly a time check, gone across to Wegmuller there. Still a couple of lone chases, so there'll be Taffy at the back now, and Willems has got his breath back, so he's now helping with the chase. But they really are in no man's land, they're making no impression at all on those leaders, and you can see that they really are also labouring now. So Willems and Taffy, they do just as well to fall back into the group, but they may be hanging on there just in the hope that a small reactionary group will come up to them, and they might well yet contact the leaders. Well, the weather at the start was very warm and sunny, but it's now become quite overcast. There was uh, quite a few people at the start saying that it would be raining by the finish in Roubaix. And if you look at the sky to the right there, there might be one from you. And still, a very big field here. 151 riders at the start this morning, which is a little bit down on the classic field. 200 are allowed to start, but because of the team compositions, they they never get quite 200, but they usually get 198. We're on to sector 10 now of the Pave, zone number 10. And this is at Oshi. And we're approximately 40, 42 miles from the finish. And I think the truth being known with the teams here, there's a lot of riders still do not want to come to ride Paris Bay in Jurain taken a rest. He isn't here and neither is Gianni Bugno who simply doesn't want to come. There was great hope that Argentin, who's always a classic winner in Belgium at this time of the year, he would actually come here and give us uh, a display in his first Paris Bay, but he pulled out two days to go, although three days to go his manager told us he was going to start. He changed his mind. Oh, that's 
Ludwig in the front now, setting the tempo, hiding with his hands on the centre of the handlebars and just seeing the way through the cobblestones. This is one of the less severe stretches of cobblestones. The official gap on the leaders at the moment, 2 minutes and 13 seconds. And one of the riders who we've heard has fallen but got back into the race, Franco Ballerini. This is an attack by Edwig van Hooydonk. Try now to pick up the tempo. We've gone back up to the leaders briefly. This is Van Slyk and Duclo Lazalle working hard, but at the back of the line, which is unusual, Thomas Wegmuller. And you can feel every ounce of those cobblestones bouncing through his body. When you're on these cobblestones, you ride big gears and you ride them as fast as you can. And I would think right now that Duclo Lazalle is enjoying having those the shock absorbers on his front forks. And I wonder if they make any difference to the ride over the cobbles indeed. Leg Muller, Van Poppel, in the far right Van Slyke. It's interesting to see that Duke Lozal has now decided to take a rest at the back of this group. He's worked so hard in it so far. And uh, they are actually on zone 11 here. lead over the two chases, by the way, of Willems and Taffy is a minute and 50 seconds. And the latest check back to the field, two minutes and 15. Now, this, uh, that corner there is so often one of the bad corners on Peru Bay, but in fact today, because it's been so dry for weeks here in Europe, there's only uh, a little bit of mud and mostly dust. And that, to many of the followers of Peru Bay, is quite disappointing, really. They prefer to see the riders slipping and sliding making the way to Roubaix, looking rather like coal miners. I'm sure the riders don't share that view. Greg Muller up on the grass, always runs the risk of a flat. And now to the field. They're on the previous sector of Pave here, this will be zone 10 for them. And there's Sean Kelly up into third place, the first time you've seen Sean Kelly come into the picture in that white World Cup leader's jersey. Bauer is there as well, Van Hooydonk is there, Ludwig is also there. Now this is a very select group that's getting to the front and they're trying now to break this main field. They've got to get a group working from this main field. I mean, two minutes, 15 seconds now is beginning to look a little bit serious for this main field. It's very, very big, it's ungainly, it's unmanageable. And the top riders, and they're beginning to crack luck. The gaps are now forming in the field. Kelly is riding so well in third place. Just trying to pin down the rider at uh, the front of the group. But I think it's Franco Ballerini who's actually setting the pace there. In fact, I'm sure it is. Two minutes, ten seconds. So they're coming back. The four leaders are beginning to lose their advantage. Which at one stage, in a slightly different composition of riders, was up to five minutes in the early days of Paris Bay this morning. tail of the field, which is now very much under pressure. One or two riders here now are just sitting in and trying to hang on, and the riders at the front are trying to split this group up. This is a very large group, indeed, for this stage in Peru Bay. And a lot may be said to the fitness of these riders, because in Milan San Remo we had a, almost a record field reach there, San Remo, and apparently it's because of the long, excellent training winter they've had, with very mild weather here in Europe. All the professional riders coming out, very fit indeed. The smaller teams, just a maximum of eight riders per team in the World Cup races. And that means that it's very difficult now to control the races, whereas the big teams could always control the races. And there are also no big persons in uh, the peloton this year, like Eddie Merckx or Bernard Hino, who seem to have their presence at the front and could control the attacks much better. And I think that's proved in the Tour de Flanders, where the long attack completely misjudged by the main field, much to the annoyance of Edwin van Hooydonk, who finished third, and of course Jackie Durand, who went on to his first major victory. Now, have they done it again here? Because Van Slyke is in a, a bit of trouble. He's been sitting at the back. Clearly, it wasn't just because he couldn't work, he didn't want to work, it's because he couldn't work. And he's trying now, he's been dropped on that sector of Parve, which was zone number nine 
for the leaders. And there's Ballerini at the front, and Bowers up there as well. Now Rudy Darlins is there too, former world champion. And Greg Lamond is here too. Lamond trying now to break up the rhythm of Ballerini. Ballerini wants Bauer to come through. Bauer wants uh, whoever's behind him, Lamond, to come through. Well, there's no way Greg will come through. Greg will be only too pleased when they freewheel because every time they freewheel, they lose the rhythm. They, it takes a while to get back into it again. And while they do this, they will not close the gap on Duclo Lazalle and that lead group. And Van Slyke has got back up to the two leaders. So Wegmuller has gone, and we didn't see him go there, but Thomas Wegmuller has dropped off the back of this group. Now, did he puncture or did he blow? But either way, he's no longer with Duclos Lazalle, so that's a very strong man gone from this league group. They're carrying a passenger with Rick Van Slyke, and uh, the only man now working a lot apart from Duclos Lazalle is Jean-Paul Van Poppel. Van Poppel looks over his shoulder, takes a good look at Van Slyke. He may have told from his face that there's no way he's going to share the pace. He immediately took the wheel of Duclo. And the surprising thing is the two professionals here don't seem in any mood to make Van Slyke take the pace. So they must have assessed that he is in fact a weakness in this league group. There's Gilbert. He's been so many good Paris Bays over the years. 37 years of age now. This is Brian Holm who's come to the front. He doesn't win many races, but he picks them. Paris Brussels, uh, winner of Paris Brussels, won two classic races. And uh, the Tulip Riders, a little bit out of this race today. But both Brian Holm and Son Lilholt said to me yesterday that they hoped that they could put in a good performance. They feel they have good form, but it's just not coming in results. Well, it looks as though Duclos Lazalle is now becoming the strong man of this three threesome at the front. As the gap is coming down, it's still coming down too. It's heading towards the two minute mark now. could completely fall apart this breakaway. It's been under pressure right from the word go. The first hour today, they did 25 miles. In the second hour, the breakaway with a favorable wind, uh, so be it, they did 28 miles. So an enormous distance covered in the first two hours. And they might now be feeling that it's all gonna go wrong with the dust. And the chase is trying desperately to establish itself. Panasonic driving on. They've got so many winners on this team, but they've got to get them up to the lead, obviously, to do it. Zone number seven for the Panasonic riders. And Lozelle, Van Poppel, and Van Slyke. As we get towards the end of the cobble sections here, these get worse and worse now, because we're in the area now where the organizers really have had to shop around to find the roads that are still cobbled, and they're usually just tracks now because all of the main highways have been asphalted over the years, the organization becoming very concerned. As indeed it has to be said is the region here, the Pan Pad de Nord Pas de Calais, because they want this race to survive like everybody does. But without the cobbles, it wouldn't have an identity. There'd be no point in Paris Bay anymore without the cobblestones. It is the feature of the event, and it's come a long way since 1896. always finished on the velodrome at Roubaix except for one or two years in fact uh, back in 1986 it was the first time it did not finish on Paris Roubaix it was also the time when they found a big sponsor that put up the prize list from about a thousand dollars to the best part of thirty thousand dollars so it's a, a very impressive leap and Sean Kelly was the winner of that but it returned back to the Roubaix velodrome when it was won by Jean-Marie Vampers in 1989 and one has to say that's the place it should always finish. They've hyped it up down the finish now, track racing, the mountain bike, that's Jalabert gone, Jalabert in the chase group. So the French Hope is in trouble and this is one of his teammates just taking a little look to see how he is. Frenchman on the Spanish Once team and uh, Jalabert, if he came to the sprint, will be in with a chance, but I'm afraid he's still a little way off the pace. Motorola riders squeezing two on the inside, look like Michel Zanoli. He 
too is a great sprinter, but you've got to get to the finish to use your sprint. And at the moment, it looks as though Duclos Lazalle is going to try it on his own. Because Lazalle and what is the chase group here? Yes, Van Poppel and Van Slyke. So Lazalle has sensed that both of them are in trouble and he decides to go alone. Well, he's a long way to go. Now, if Duclos Lazalle does want to go on his own, he is going to have to go and hang on, hanging on his own now because, in fact, uh, Duclos has sensed that those two riders are not strong enough. The dust indicates where the peloton is. And that, to me, and look at the line, that has reduced by about half the length of that peloton. But it's still far too big. They've still got to split that group up because, again, it's left to Panasonic at the front on their own. And if Panasonic they don't split that group up, they're not going to bring across their strong men. And Duclos Lazal has gambled here on a long one. I'm not too sure this is a wise decision, but he's been left with no choice in the matter. He's been out in front uh, since the fight of Arenberg when he moved across the league from the main field with Jean-Paul Van Poppel. He contacted the leaders. Van Poppel attacked immediately with du Duclos Lazal to split them up. And now he's had to leave all of them behind. There's a good shot of those uh, rock shocks absorbers that are used on the front forks here now of Duclos Lazal's machine. And if he won this event where he knows, well, I guess that everybody will be riding the next year. Got a little bit of mud on our camera lens now. And I can tell you, on some of Paris Bays, it's hard to see the riders through the camera lens because of the mud. But today, it is mostly dust, which can be even more annoying to the riders when it blows into the eyes. But these days, of clear lensed glasses has kept most of that problem at bay. Van Slyke now having to work, and I don't think he's got the legs. The flag's flying for America there. Well, at least it's the team of the American Greg LeMond who's out in front with Gilbert Duclos Lazal, who is a rider over the years, who has always landed one or two big ones. I once remember Paris Nice uh, when Gilbert Duclos Lazal won Paris Nice. He was the last Frenchman to win it until this year when Jean Francois Bernard won it uh, back in 1980. Duclos Lazal. He rode the time trial up the Col d'Ez and then came in the press room to watch it played back on television and he cheered himself in the time trial as if he was uh, he didn't know the result. It was very, very amusing. He's the most popular rider. In 1983, of course, his career almost came to an end. Uh, he's a great hunter, except that when he was, uh, I believe, climbing down a tree, the shotgun went off and the pellets went through his hand. And for a while it looked as though he might be uh, in doubt as to his future as a professional bike rider. But back he came, and he's certainly back at the moment. This field is thinning out at the back. But again, you see how the riders are fanning into a big bunch. It means nobody is driving this group. And if they don't find themselves a leader shortly, then Duclos Lazal will slip the field. The Z riders sitting near the front and trying to keep control of this race. And at the moment, they've got it. Greg Lamond is up there. Van Hooydonk is on the far left of our picture. He's looking for something to try, someone to try and get a movement going with him. Van Hooydonk came to the fore when he turned pro and finished fifth in his first Paris-Roubaix but he's still to get his victory. Duclos Lazal there in slow motion, suffering well. And now the Panasonics, Jack Hanegraaff to the right of our picture. And the Panasonic team moving up in force to try and alter the course of this race. They have a tremendous team here. This is Jack Hanegraaff. And we've got Mark Van Orso has come up. And also Ludwig is here. That's Van Orso on the far left of our picture. Very strong domestique of Panasonic. And he's riding on tremendous form this year too. But it looks as though they're going to leave the Panasonics to try and bring this down. The Tulip riders in those light green jerseys have moved near the front, but they're not throwing too much into the chase. A while now on his own and being cheered by a crowd here who can hear this on radio. They know exactly who's coming at them. And if they're close enough to a house, which they're certainly not here at the moment, they could also watch Duclos Lazal approach their stretch of the course on television as well because he's live on television and Gilbert Duclos Lazal, this most popular Frenchman now, is going to have to hang on because he's got no help from anybody. He sensed they were weak. He had to leave them earlier, I'm sure, than he wanted to. And the question is now, can he survive to Roubaix? Well, if anybody knows the way, it's Duclos. This is his 14th Paris-Roubaix. He's already finished 11. He's twice finished second. And... Uh, 
surely this isn't going to be the day he's going to win it. Because if it is, it will be a dream come true for Duke Lola's out. The gap is coming down, I have to say. The gap is coming down. It's around 1 minute 35 seconds now. So there's a still a long way to go as well. Something like 15 miles to the finish. And there's a little group trying to get away from uh, down the bottom there. And uh, well, that was Van Poppel, of course, and Van Slyke. Looking back here, now look at this. The charge is on here. This group is reluctant to split up, though, isn't it? My goodness me, these are just the Panasonics doing all of the work. No assistance from anyone, and we've seen this this year in all of the classic races, that the big teams don't seem to want to help each other to bring back the attackers. And as a result, the attackers, those men who are gambling a long ways from the finish, are finding they're coming to the finish and in with a real chance of winning. And that's exactly what's happening today with Duke Lola's out. This is about the worst stretch of cobbles. This is zone uh, number six, I believe, and this is the worst stretch of cobbles on the course. It's almost a link row between two fields. They just charge across the field and out of the other end. And Duke Lozal is safely out of it. Back on the smooth road. A little look over the fields there to see if he can spot the dust. Because we're now sort of going in almost a circle here to get round to set course of Pirate Bay. The favourable wind is no longer favourable. It won't stay on his face for too long. But it is no longer favourable. And if he looks across, because of the flat roads here, you can tend to sense where the race is by the helicopters, and there are four of them flying over the race today, and you can sense where the main field is. But the same has to be said too, that the main field will know where Duclo Lozal is by the helicopter that's producing our pictures here. From the motorbike, and that's the reason we get that little bit of shimmy on the pictures occasionally, because the houses here are interfering with the signals. And Lozal is using all of the road here He's lumbering along, but he's still riding stronger. This is not the sign of a man who is cracking at all. He shed Thomas Wegmuller. In fact, we now know that Wegmuller, in fact, punctured, which was very, very bad luck. He wasn't dropped from that lead group. He's punctured. He's got a flat tire. He's out and back in the main field. If indeed he's still in this main field now, because I would have thought that the disappointment, uh, he would have no real drive now to continue in that main field. There's the famous Mavic service, which is the only, the only race where they all ride on motorbikes in the hope they can reach riders in trouble quickly. And we're at the back of the race here, and the Tulip rider there is probably coming back from a change wheel. I'm trying to pick out who that Tulip rider is. But I think, in fact, it's Peter Peters who has come back up to the group from a puncture. We'll go right out at the front now, back to Duclos Lazal. As the crow flies, Roubaix is not very far away, but we're still tracing around the fields over to the left of Roubaix. And he's settling nicely now into his time trialling rhythm, and many people forget, in fact, that Duclos Lozal was once the pursuit champion of France as a professional. Uh, I think that was back in 1983, the same year that he won his only classic, Bordeaux Paris. And sadly, that race now no longer held. It was the longest classic in the world, and that was done largely behind these small motorbikes, which they called Dernies. And Duclo won that back in 1983. The same year, in fact, his career became in danger because by October of that year, he was in hospital following the shooting incident. Seems to be a habit on the Z team, doesn't it, with Greg LeMond? But now both riders seem to be back on form. LeMond riding an excellent race today. Greg might be a little bit disappointed, he's having to play the defender, I don't know, because he, he's a great friend of Gilbert Duclos Lazal, and I think he'd be as happy as anybody if he could keep him away to the finish now. He's certainly trying, because back in the field, Lamont is trying to disrupt the chase. These two are holding on, although the field is closing in on them, they're still out there, second and third on the road. Van Slyke seems to have found new legs, because now he's doing the majority of the pacemaking in this chase with uh, Van Poppel. Let's have a look at the gap. It's a long way. Duclos Lazal has flown. There he is with his flotilla of motorbikes. And our camera to the near left of our picture. And there's the picture from that very camera right now. And Lazal tapping out the rhythm. Well, Duclos Lazal, he's won more than 
60 races in his career since he turned professional. And he's been a pro a long time, just like Sean Kelly, 1977. Duplo turned pro for Peugeot. He's coming up to 38 years of age. It seems to be the season of old men, doesn't it? And I don't mean that in any way disrespectful because these boys really know how to look after their bodies and to get the best out of them. And if your mind doesn't go stale, the body won't. And uh, like Sean Kelly, Duke Lozal's mind is certainly not stale. He still comes out and rides these races like he's a 19-year-old. He's pushed away two younger men here in Van Poppel and Van Slyke. And it seems to be all Van Slyke now. Van Poppel, the easing out of the saddler, that's the sign that the legs are now aching, the back is aching, and that life is no longer really pleasant in Paris Bay for Jean-Paul Van Poppel. Reaction from the group here. Rudy Darlins who's trying to get away and it is indeed Darlins who's coming clear another man that enjoys Paris-Roubaix he's been in the top five on I think three occasions and the rider who's coming up with him number 182 Theo Ackermans from the Festina team and again the interference there coming very neatly from Jean-Claude Colotti on the Z team to try and break up any semblance of attack which will form there's Colotti Second last year to give the French a very rare one-two. It's only been done once before, I think, in Paris Bay. And now Colotti having to adapt to a very different role. He's not thinking of winning this sprint for victory in Paris Bay. He's just thinking now of breaking up the rhythm in pursuit of teammate Duclo Lazal. This is Hendrik Verdant. Last year, Verdant, well, would he have won or wouldn't he have won? He punctured when clear on his own and then had to stand and just watch the rest of the race go past him. David Solofeld has come to the front now for the Buckler team. Time to try and close down this gap. Alarm bells are beginning to ring now in this big group because Buckler know they've got to close this gap and then they might well have the winner in Edwig van Hoyerdonk or Jelle Nijdam. They're both in this league group. And again, look for the Z team and that's Le Mans looking around trying to uh, slow down and break up the rhythm. Zollerfeld giving it everything now, nobody helping him. Once more, a demonstration of just one team having to take on the workload. Nobody coming through on him at all. Well, I don't suppose the Lotto team will want to close down just yet on Van Slyke. He's up there for a place in the top three. And certainly the Z team aren't going to help, so there's going to be a bit of a gap down that line where nobody's going to help it. When Zollerfeld sits up and looks over his shoulder, going to find nobody willing to take up the chase and while this keeps going on this breakaway will not pull back Duke Lola's out unless he blows and Zollerfeld I think begin to think it's time somebody else come through and did somewhere he's got a good rhythm going hasn't he chopping off the apex of each of the corners now he wants somebody to come through and look oh we're on a bend maybe that was the reason he free wheeled but we're back up with the leader now well, he's still tapping out the rhythm, but I get the feeling that he's also beginning to get tired. Duclo Lazal, his shoulders are rolling a little bit there. The view down. Now the question is, have those two riders stayed clear? The helicopter searching vainly down a long, long slice of road. And just around the corner there, there are the two leaders, they are there, but I think if we were able to look behind the houses, we're going to see the chase group are closing in pretty quickly on these two. And it looks to me as though it's all Van Slyke now. Van Poppel, I think, has hit the wall. He's not doing anything at all to assist Rick Van Slyke. So isn't it funny how the body changes over the miles because Van Slyke was in trouble not 45 minutes ago. And uh, now it's Van Poppel who is hanging on at the back. Now, just how far have those two got? Not a long way. There they are. And it is really a very, very big bunch. They're still coming towards Roubaix. And again, the Z boys have got themselves under control at the front. They are slowing down the brake on this narrow stretch of road. And once more, it's down to Panasonic to try and lift the rhythm. John Paul Colotti in the lead, everything going according to plan. Bernard Eno won the race of course and never rode it again. And he's now part of the organization, which isn't bad for a man that thought this was an inhuman bike event to become part of the organization. You get a more comfortable ride, I suppose. 
Duke Lola's out. Would be a very popular winner. The French, you know, very rarely win this race. Uh, virtually every classic throughout the world has always been won primarily by riders from the host nation. Well, this is the one exception. 46 victories have gone to Belgium in Paris-Roubaix, and only 27 of them have gone to France. If you want the rest of the statistics, well, seven of them were won by Italians, and four of them by the Dutch, and two of them by the Irish, or should I say one Irishman, because Sean Kelly's won them both. Christophe Capel is also up here too, along with Colotti, Brian Holm, here's Gleg Lamond. Well, Greg is looking sharp today. A lot of people fancy Greg for victory at the start this morning. Well, he's never had the chance to actually take on Paris Bay for win because Duke Lozal went very early on. There's Son Lilholt who feels his form is good, so the Tulip boys are now having to contribute to the chase. Sean Kelly in the white in the centre of the picture, and even the Gatorade team, although they too are sort of leaderless without Jenny Bunyo here, are trying now to force themselves up towards the leaders. Fignon is their leader, we haven't seen him all day. And Giovanni Fidanza was the Gatorade rider who was peeping into our picture there. Well, this is amazing. They're allowing the Z boys to keep the tempo high, but not too high that they're pulling back Duplo Lazal. And as long as they do this, they won't pull him back either. The Lotto team trying to come through on the right, TVM on the far left of the picture. Making full use now of the tailwind again. But this is not the tempo that's going to pull back the rollers out, and I would think that Greg Lamond will be feeling very content with the attitude of the other professionals right now. Lotto not willing to chase too hard because they know Van Slyke, they must know he's tired, and they must know surely that Duke Lola's alley is on his own. And back now with Duclo Lazal, so we've gone forward to Duclo Lazal as he continues now going towards Roubaix. And the kilometres are ticking away very, very nicely. But it looks to me as though Duclo is beginning to get himself in a little bit of trouble. These two are still staying clear. And that is attributing itself purely to Van Slyke because nobody else is working in that group now. Van Poppel can't work. There's Nidam come to the front. And this is Roger Leger. He only finished the Paris Bay once back in the 70s, 74, I think it was. And he finished in the 70s too. But now Leger is just going to try and get the last strength, ounce of strength, out of Gilbert Duclos Lazal. Because of all the people that Leger would love to see win this now, it is him. Gilbert Duclos Lazal, Mr. Paris Bay. And these people here will have seen him coming towards this village on their television screen. And now they're going to cheer him through it. And the French applauding all of the way. Because it's not just for France, this one. It's for a very special man indeed, if he can survive. This is the 90th running too. What a way to celebrate it. One of the oldest winners he would be. In fact, the oldest winner, while we're talking about that, is Pino Cerami back in 1960. And because they're celebrating their 90th running of Paris Bay today, Cerami is actually here in the following caravan. So that would be very fitting, wouldn't it? And I would say too that Pino Cerami looks a very fit man indeed. He looks to be in his 70s, but he's very fit. Well, there may not even have been anything wrong with those gears. It's often a situation whereby the mechanic will give him a little bit of a psychological boost, just come along and help him for a couple of seconds. Didn't choose a very good place to do it, I must say, with that central reservation looming up. Now, what will annoy uh, Duclos Lazal is the dust being stirred up by those lead motorbikes on the cobbles. Because that's going to be very, very annoying to his eyes. And again, Lazal chooses to just use those shock absorbers on the forks and crash straight down the middle of the road. He's not searching for the loose the gravel or the grass on the right or the left of the road, he just goes a big gear and just bounces over the cobbles down the road. The news is reaching us too from out on the course that the Motorola team, amongst a number of riders today, are having one of those forgetful Paris Bays that, so far as we can work out, they have had 10 flat tyres amongst the team riders, and Dagotto Lodson is listed amongst the fallers, although he's up and riding again. Well, that is amazing. Kelly has gone twice uh, with punctures, and he's rejoined that chase group. 
Well, it'll take a lot more than a few flat tyres to keep Sean Kelly out of the front. And he does look strong. He's riding in that lead group. And uh, very often these corners are thick, slimy mud, but not so today. Barely wet. The interesting thing about Duclos Rizal is he is not a man of northern France. He comes from down on the edge of the Pyrenees. He's a Bayonne. And uh, there are no cobblestones down there. I once remember when he took the lead in the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France, which isn't bad because he can't climb hills very well, and certainly not amongst the great climbers. And he took them over the small hills, early stages of the tour, and he arrived in Po at the foothills of the Pyrenees, wearing the polka dot jersey as King of the Mountains, to an enormous cheer uh, from the public, all of them, and many of them were personal friends. And they were falling about laughing when they saw him wearing the polka dot leader of the King of the Mountains, the Pyrenees, literally uh, out there next morning. And he enjoyed the joke with them. And I think that's why everybody likes him. He is a very, very popular man. This is Bauer. Bauer again putting on a good performance in the race he seems to ride so well in. He's got to the front. He's got to do something now. Duclos Lazal is surviving far too long in the lead. And although they're closing down, we're talking of five and six seconds at a time. Then they free wheel and, and Duclos Lazal is taking it back again. A little chance to have a look in slow motion at the pounding the bike is taking, not to mention the bones in the body over the cobblestones as we're coming now towards the end of the cobblestones in this year's Pairu Bay. They've got to apply the pressure at the front and they must break up that big group because if they don't break that group up, they're never going to come back and pull back Duclos Lazal. There's the blackboard man, but well, he didn't show us the blackboard, unfortunately. I think he showed it to Duclos Lazal. Now, this is Nico Verhoeven, in fact. So it might well be they've wiped out. And that's Le Mans coming across, too. So I think they may have picked up now Van Poppel and Van Slyk. We never saw the capture on television. But this is Nico Verhoeven, a rider who seems to me to have refound himself this year. A very talented rider, but he's got good uh, confidence. And Le Mans equally, the same must be said of him, because Le Mans is playing the perfect teammate. He shot out the peloton to try and pin down Nico Verhoeven. If Verhoeven got across to Duclos Lazal, he would beat him, that's for sure. He's a good finisher, and Greg is going to take him, and then maybe he'll just sit on the back wheel of him. I don't think Greg will participate, even though he's reduced it to one man. He's checking to see the proximity of the chase. Well, this is a very strong attack here by Verhoeven. And Le Monde has got him. Well, Le Monde has got him, and he's not going to help him. So, Greg Le Monde pins down Nico Verhoeven, and now seems content. He hardly looks out of breath either, Greg. Seems content now just to... Uh, and is he thinking of going through and working with him? Maybe. Because he's just making sure that there's nobody else there. And the Zed could finish up first and second today if they keep this up. This is Duclo, and our cameraman there, right up behind him, holding his camera almost on the cobblestones. We're in one of the dustiest sections of the course here now, and that's going to be sending a message rather like smoke signals back to that chase group, which is closing in now to around 55 seconds. There's every chance now that Duclo, if he hits the wall, and to me he's not riding as well as he was, uh, then he could well be wiped here before the finish in Roubaix. I have to say I feel, feel rather sad about that now because he's been out in front really for the last 70 miles of this event. He went clear in the forest of Orenburg, 68 miles from the finish. And ever since then he has been the driving force of the lead group. And of course these last 20 odd miles he's been out on his own. Kelly at the front of the chase group now. Johan Museo is up there too. It looks like Olaf Ludwig moving up on the outside. Greg Lamond is there as well. Nico Verhoeven. So they brought them back. And Kelly is the man who's punctured twice. And I also understand, and we'll, we'll have to find out later, but I think he's had a broken back wheel as well. Leger clearly getting concerned now that Duclos Lazal is going to hit the wall. The constant visit to cheer him on. He's not allowed to do that too often, of course. The race commissaires will stop him, but at this stage, I think there'll be a lot of people supporting Duclos Lazal. And that the television coverage on Pirate Bay this year better than ever before. So a lot of France will know now exactly the feat of Duclos Lazal. And they have managed at long last to break up that big bunch. This is a select group now that's going clear. And this might sign the death warrant of Duclos Lazal because they've got a group going there. 
as Duclo Lazal pounds over the cobblestones. And this is Dante Rezzi. Dante Rezzi from RMO is trying to go clear. So they split the group, and if Rezzi gets away, then he's going to try and evoke an attack from the back. And Rezzi looks as though he's been riding a lot in the wheels today, and now he's, he's saved everything for one big move. His face absolutely black. But he's got clear of the field. Now the pursuit has begun. The official gap is still around about two minutes from Lazelle back to that chase group. And that is the official time check. Well, it's still a long way. And we're approximately 22 miles from the finish now. That's about 40 minutes still with that. Yes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes of racing still to go for Duclo Lazelle. That's an awful long way. And riders have got back. Well, that peloton has regrouped. They've clawed their way back after the stretch of cobbles, which will be zone number 10, uh, zone number 8, rather. And still Lazelle survives out on his own. The former 5,000 metres pursuit champion of France. Well, it's a little bit more than five kilometres he's been out there today. There's still a few Motorola boys down there. Well, certainly Steve Bowers down there. And Sean Yates, I saw the big English rider Sean Yates, who really should win a lot of races, but he's so unselfish in his attitude to help other members of Motorola score that he very often gives up his own opportunity at victory. Well, he's in that league group at the moment. And this corridor of noise, the crowd just yell, Ale Duplo. Riders reforming now. Kelly, not too far away. Van Hoyerdonk, this is Yellen Nydam. He could do now with his father's talent back in 1961. Henk Nydam, the world amateur pursuit champion. Yellen Nydam has done a lot more than dad because he's become a tremendous all round cyclist. He's proved to be a fast sprinter too, as well as a, a stayer. And a very strong man, and also has results this win, this uh, early season as well already. Well, at last they seem to be thinning that group out. They keep coming back, and then they keep dancing off the back on the cobblestones. But now it's Van Hoydonk, and Steve Bauer grabs his wheel. So Van Hoydonk trying to go clear now. The man that came and finished fifth in his first ever Paris Bay is still waiting for the victory. And he has tremendous form. He was robbed by Jackie Durand in the Tour de Flanders last week when he had to be content with third place. And he misjudged the breakaway. Bauer bouncing his back wheel, jumping all over the place there, holding on to the wheel of Edric Van Hoydonk. And it looks as though, for the moment, the Zeds are having to content themselves near the front, but not at the front. I think the Zeds have four riders in this group. Frédéric Moncassin, who will be the sprinter if it came, along with Jean-Paul Colotti, uh, Christophe Capel, and of course Greg Lamond, and I think also Philippe Casado is here. So they've kept a lot of their riders in this final selection from the main field. And they're going to have to work hard now to hold them off. Look at the face here of Van Hoydon. He is going to be very annoyed if he's been uh, ruined uh, another shot at a big classic victory by a breakaway that's gone so far from the finish. Because he is a tremendous rider in these spring classics, the long, ungainly Edric Van Hoydon. And once more, we've got Leger alongside. Just giving Duke Lola's out words of encouragement, just saying you're doing all right, you're okay, they're not closing in that fast, you can make it. Drop down. It's still a long, long way. There they are. But that turn by Van Hoydonk has done some damage now. A lot of riders have got to the front. I think it's possibly Johan Museo who's come up to the front now. And again, Greg. Master has got up to the second place there. Oh, yes, is it Greg? Yep, go alongside, try and slow it down again. Kelly's on his wheel, Bauer is there too, but you see nobody willing to help the Lotto rider. And certainly Zed are going to drive the pace. Somebody's come through, and that looks like it's Olaf Ludwig who's come through on the inside. Museo's not taking his wheel, neither is Greg. Greg's looked at Johan, Johan's looked at Greg, and it looks as though Olaf is going to put in an effort. As the field bunches up behind, 
Well, this is amazing. I mean, Ludwig just came from the back of this group at almost a third of the speed of that bunch again and has been allowed to pedal straight off the front. No reaction. Olaf Ludwig, the former East German, whose last big victory as an amateur was the Olympic Championship in Seoul, the road race title. I then saw him the same year in Australia when he crashed in his first day of a race I was reporting and he broke his wrist and he didn't speak any English so he used the cast on his wrist to bang on the bar and shout beer and he always got one because he's a big boy. But now Ludwig in fact does speak English quite well and he's gone, well this is a tremendous, well we're just 10 miles from the finish now and Ludwig appears to have gone clear. Well as he left it too late the official time gap is 55 seconds now and 10 miles to go and the field behind I can't believe they've allowed one man after all this shadow boxing to shoot off the front and not chase him down but Ludwig is clear at the moment it's about eight or nine seconds the gap the great tragedy about Olaf Ludwig really is because of his uh, the situation as an East German until a couple of years ago he was not allowed to turn professional and now he is shot to the top of professional racing but of course he's almost at the end of his career because he is in fact 32 years of age. Birthday tomorrow by the way, when he'll be 33. Tremendous performer as an amateur. He was on the same team as Jan Schur, now they're on rival teams of course. Jan Schur we saw earlier in the breakaway on the Motorola squad but together they were Olympic team time trial champions as well. champion of East Germany before it became totally uh, united as one country. And it looks to me as though Duke Lozal is finding himself in a little bit of trouble now and he's absolutely flying Olaf Ludwig. The gap is coming down tremendously now. It is 38 seconds the gap. So Olaf Ludwig is going across at the very end of Paris-Roubaix. This could be a tremendous finish. Now, I wonder if the crowd know the danger now that's coming their way. Because I think that Duclos Lazal is now hitting the wall. It's been a long day out for him. His shoulders are rocking and rolling. He's turning at the biggest gear he can there. So that's going to take his strength shortly away from him. And Gilbert Duclos Lazal, his position has hardly changed, has it? He sat there locked in and just tried to force those pedals around. The French versus Germany. And it's a fitting time to remark that Germany have never won Paris Bay since the very first event in 1896 when Josef Fischer was the winner. Wegmuller came close. Oh, sorry, Wegmuller was a Swiss. There's only one Swiss winner, winner as well with Henri Suter. Wegmuller almost uh, got his second victory for the Swiss a few years back when Dirk de Mol beat him in a plastic bag wrapped around his, his gears in the sprint. And now we've got another similar chase going on here with Olaf Ludwig trying to make it number two for the Germans. He is on excellent form, Olaf Ludwig, and he just loves racing in this part of France, just over the border from Belgium, where he's had a number of successes already this season. I remember this morning at breakfast, because he was staying in the same hotel as us, he looked out the window and I said, it's nice weather, Ludwig. He said, yes, it's very nice, he said, and there was a smile on his face, and <laughs> I wonder what he was thinking. Well, the motorbikes are being sent through because that gap is closing down. It's a pity we can't swing round with our camera. I guess the uh, our, our motorcycle mounted camera would have a bit of a job to do that. But it can't be far back. This is, uh, this is the main field of what's left of them. And it looks as though Van Hooydonk taking a drink there now is feeling that the birds have flown and he made his move and it didn't work. He was a marked man, obviously much closer marked than Olaf Ludwig, who found it much easier to escape. And as a result, this group is now falling back even further. So they're staying at around a minute, and Ludwig, I think realistically, is the only man left now who can actually catch Duclos out, and he knows it. Now, I wonder if Ludwig could see, this was a long straight road here we've just seen, I wonder if Ludwig could see the cars following the leader, Gilbert Duclos Lazal, because there's a left-hand turn at the top of this road, and I've got a feeling that out of the corner of my eye, we could just see Ludwig. Here we are, we're in that village now, and this is the left-hand turn coming up. It bears round to the right, in fact, and then goes left. And I'm wondering if indeed 
Ludwig can now see this man. And if he can see him, uh, then he's going to catch him. The only advantage here, I would say, for Ludwig, uh, no, for rather for Duclo Lazal, is the last couple of kilometres around the back streets of taking us into Roubaix continually change direction, and that must go in his favour. Because if Ludwig can't keep him in his sight, then he might become a little bit demoralised. What a dramatic pursuit this is. There are very few Paris Bays, and I certainly have never reported one that has resulted in a pursuit like this to the finish. And this is Brian Holm now, who's trying to launch an attack. Ludwig is, uh, not Ludwig rather, Van Hoy Donk is straight on. That's really Don and Stu who's come up onto the back wheel. Of course, Panasonic's have a new role to play now. They don't want to chase down anybody anymore now because they've got their man away. They want to stop this chase getting up to Ludwig. And indeed, Duclo Lazal has found himself some new friends on that team. Leger looks to me as though he's itching to get back up alongside uh, Duclo Lazal and speak to him, but I think the race commissaires will have stopped that by this stage. And Lazal is now on his own. On his own, as indeed he has been uh, for the majority of this race today, because although he's been in small groups since the fight of Arnberg, he's always been the man dictating affairs. And if he does win this race, he's a totally deserving winner and will never be seen as a fortunate winner who read the right move early on. He's been a tower of strength. This is Ludwig, trying to close it down. Still, his position too never alters. Sits there in that lovely time trialling mode. Won a stage of the Tour de France at Besançon. The same year he went on to win the green jersey. Points competition. Now, to land the victory in Paris-Roubaix will be special. Especially as only one German has ever done it. There's Ballerini now, too. Another man of the classics. Over the level crossing. One year I remember coming to that crossing and the breakaway was stopped by a train. It got a little bit exciting for a few minutes, but they got through uh, before the peloton arrived and they survived. But uh, I would think that Duclo Lazal must have breathed a sigh of relief when he clattered over that level crossing because it comes so close to the finish, about five miles from the end. Ballerini has split the field with this fine turn at the front. Now he wants somebody to come through and do some work. Well, he won't get it off Greg Lamont, who's going to sit there happily. Johan Museo is number 61. He's come up to the lead. I think this is Jim Van Der Leer, who is uh, also up here. And in fact, it's Peter Peters. Peter Peters, who we saw come back to the race earlier on uh, from a puncher. Former champion of Holland as well. And Peter Peters is now willing to work with Johan Museo, despite the fact that Museo will win the sprint. Greg looks really cool today. He has played a magnificent role in this race, Greg LeMond. A perfect teammate. He has been strong enough to control everything they've thrown at him. He's upset their rhythm, and they've not been able to break the morale of the Z team at all. And at this moment in time, I'm not sure whether Greg realizes uh, that uh, Duclo Lazal is still surviving because they've all seen the speed that Olaf Ludwig left them with. And I would think that nobody has told them whether he's caught up with Duclo Lazal or not. Well, we can see he hasn't. And Duclo Lazal seeking the comparative comfort now of the side of the road. And again, Nidam, followed by Brian Holm. Le Monde again out of the saddle. It takes so much strength to keep riding in the top four or five riders. The flags of France flying in the face of a man from Germany. Well, this is the 90th Paris-Roubaix, but of course we're we're looking for our 91st winner. And in case you're wondering why I say that, well, they have in fact had one uh, day when they had to have two victors. Because Andre Mahe in 1949 was uh, the winner, but he was only the way he was in the lead. He went off course through no fault of his own. And Serge Coppe, who was the brother of Fausto, won the sprint. And they felt the first thing to do was declare two winners uh, back in 1949. Well, there'll be one clear winner today if he survives to the velodrome, but you know the gap is coming down. It's now it's now 31 seconds, and Leger is telling Duclo Lazal, and I'm sure that's not the news he wants to hear because he knows the strength of Ludwig, he knows the pure speed and class of that rider, and the way Ludwig is pulling back Duclo Lazal right now, you know, they could come together at the entry to the velodrome, and they could go onto the track together. It's as close as that. The crowds now are shouting for Duclo Lazal because they know, thanks to television and radio, which is live throughout the afternoon, they know exactly what this, has, this man has done 
to get him here in the lead in Paris-Roubaix. He's not somebody coming out of the far distance and they say, oh look, it's a Frenchman. They know exactly what he's done to get here and they appreciate the effort. And there is Ludwig and he's just going around the same corner which we've just seen, in fact, Duclos Lazal go down. So I would say now we're inside 30 seconds and Ludwig is coming back. Olaf Ludwig and there's a car up the road there but I don't think it's behind the Duclos Lazal. He's a bit further than that. But he's going to see, there's the helicopter you see above our picture there. Well, that is where Duke Lozal is. The other helicopter now flying over Olaf Ludwig and the main field behind. I think it's safe to say are out of it. Le Monde has done his job well there. There's just one rider escaped the pack, Olaf Ludwig. And he's got a real chance now of pulling back Duke Lozal. France versus Germany. And the 90th Paris-Roubaix is going to be remembered as a great event. Whoever wins it. And uh, it's no... Uh, it's, <laughs> The French themselves, of course, are going to want Duclos Lazal to win. But I think uh, you've got to hold the, out the hopes here that uh, Olaf Ludwig can cross the gap because he's taken his chance well. He watched all the attempts by some big names in that chase group who couldn't get away. Now it's Nidam left to do all the pacemaking and Brian Holm. Le Monde interfering in third place. The Lotto boys should really throw the weight behind it as well because they know that if they could catch all of them, and they're 55 seconds still from this lead group, of, well, from the leader on the road, which puts them about half a minute behind Ludwig. And now, Walter Plankert comes up alongside, and a word in the ear of Olaf Ludwig. It won't be easy because he's sitting on the other side of the car, but there we are. And Plankert himself has uh, ridden Paris Bay, but he's never won it. And it looks as though now they're trying to get the best and the last out of Olaf Ludwig. And again, a little bit of picture breaker for which we can only apologize as we head towards the end now of this Paris-Roubaix. And he's still on the handlebars with his head buried, but you know Duclos Lazal to me has found his second win because he's got a tremendous rhythm going here. Every turn of the pedals, if anybody knows how far it is to go and how many cobbles there are in front of him, it's Duclos Lazal coming towards the end of his 14th Paris-Roubaix. And if he can survive, it'll be the first time he's ever come home as winner. He lost to Henny Kuiper, he lost to Sean Kelly, I think it was. As he comes down now towards the finish, he's in the streets, on the outskirts of Roubaix, and it's 22 seconds the gap, and Plankett knows it. Plankett is saying 22 seconds, down goes ahead of Ludwig. Ludwig must keep looking up and thinking, where is he? He can't be going this fast so far from the finish after this long breakaway. Jean-Marie Leblanc. The organizer of this and the Tour de France standing through the roof of his car there. And he's seen some great races himself, was a great cyclist. He rode in the Tour de France for the old team Bic. And now he's witnessing what is a classic pursuit into Roubaix and what a superb end to the 90th event. And Ludwig really could still get onto, onto Duclos Lazal at the entrance of the velodrome, or even worse, for Duclos that is, he could catch him on the one and three quarter laps of the track. Well, Duclos might have something to say about that. It seems like a good time to remind you of the positions in previous Paris-Roubaix of Gilbert Duclos Lazal. If he wins today, he'll be the second oldest winner of the event, turning pro in 1977. He rode the event for the first time in 1978, when he finished 28th. He's now, when he finishes this one, he'll have finished 12 of the 14. He's had a second in 80, a second in 83, a fourth in 89, a sixth in 1990. He was 12th last year. And surely, he must have thought that he would never ever, at 37 and virtually 38 years of age, win Paris-Roubaix. Well, he's now coming towards the end. He's as far as the eye can see because Ludwig can see him. And in fact, Ludwig is, is being held now at 23 seconds. That's the latest check. So the second check verifies the fact that Ludwig is not closing anymore on Gilbert Duclos Lazal. And just look at it, I think Ludwig's effort has been has paid for the effort, he's at the end of the cobblestone, he's just exited Parve sector number one. Now it is a run through to the finish at Roubaix and the lovely smooth concrete of the velodrome that has welcomed this race virtually since it's here, beginning in 1896. The 19th of April, 1896 was the date of the first Paris-Roubaix. It was won by a German, Joseph Fischer, but it won't be won by a German this time. The crowd are welcoming a Frenchman, Gilbert Duclos Lazal, and just listen to the noise here of the crowd, absolutely tremendous.
onto the stadium and Gilbert Duclos-Lazal knows now that at 14 attempts this one is for him and the man who's been denied a perfect birthday will be Olaf Ludwig because it's his birthday tomorrow Ludwig is into the sides of the stadium he'll be coming onto the track he's going to be virtually one full circuit of the velodrome behind Gilbert Duclos-Lazal and Duclos Lazal might see him come in here as he comes round the back straight. Duclos Lazal, and there he is, he's just come into the stadium. So what a great feeling for Duclos Lazal. He's racing for the win and he can see the tail of the rider who will take second place. Olaf Ludwig of Germany. And now all that remains for Duclos is the two-handed salute. He's going to do it right behind Olaf Ludwig who looks over his shoulder. And this has been one of the most memorable victories in Paris-Roubaix. Gilbert Duclos Lazal. Since 1977, he's wanted to win it, and at last, having finished second twice, he's done it, Gilbert Duclos Lazal, and let's remember he's done it too, on these special forks, which are American, and now, uh, believe me, next year, everybody will be riding them. Gilbert Duclos Lazal, mobbed by, amongst others, uh, Michel Long, the assistant team manager, former Tour de France rider as well, and here comes the sprint now, which is for third place, Jean-Claude Colotti is in this league group too. Colotti was second, of course, when he came here last year behind Mark Maddio, who escaped towards the finish. Uh, Olaf Ludwig takes second place, three wheels out of it now as the sprint builds up. For all, there's a crash there, and that's Moncasan, and he's been hit by a rider from PDM. Uh, Christoph Capelli is the other Z rider here, and I think it's Rudy Darlins as well, who has gone down to the left of our picture. There he is, Darlins. Can't believe it. He's had so many finishes in the first six, and he's been robbed again of another finish in the first six right on the line. I am sure of that. And this is Franco Ballerini leading it out here now for the finish. Johan Capio is the rider of TVM who's trying to move up on the outside too. The Tulip rider is Peter Peters. Peters has got the front here on the inside, but he's not going to get it. Capio takes it. So Johan Capio will take third place. And Greg Lamont was right up there in that group as well. Jean-Claude Colotti finishes fifth, I would say. He was third in that sprint. And just look at the crowd here. I don't think anybody noticed that crash, you know, in the stadium because they're all too busy congratulating. Gilbert Duclos Lazal of France who can now retire and by the way there's no rumour of that just yet as the winner of this event and so Duclos Lazal joins Bernardino and Marc Maddio as the only French winners of this event since 1956 and that is tremendous for France and especially so for Duclos Lazal and Greg Lamond rode a marvellous race and the first question was what did he think of it? Oh, it was a great race I mean it was uh, first of all I felt this is the best period of a really physically I've had my whole career uh, and I felt even if, if, if we came close to the victory I, I, I would be capable of, of following the best riders you gave the impression you, you were feeling so good that had they caught Duclos Lazal you would have had the strength to attack I, I, yourself no I felt very good this is the best period I've had in my career, so. Were you just as happy because Gilbert's won? Yeah, because it, I worked very hard and when, and then you're still, I didn't really know in the last 10Ks if he won or not because Ludwig went away. It was just after uh, Maceo attacked and I followed Maceo. Uh, it was, I just let up and thought somebody else would chase down Ludwig and nobody chased him down, so I was hoping Ludwig didn't catch uh, Gilbert. And uh, so when you work really hard all day and then you find out he wins, it's, you really came to this race fire today, didn't you? I'd hope to myself uh, try to win the race or top ten. I think I've got top ten today. But no, I, I, yeah. no disappointment that uh, Gilbert won. Oh, did God, no, no. Because hey, if if we would have caught him, would have won. I don't know. It's, it's, it's too too difficult to say. There were at least. I know. I, I think I would have been in the top five. But I'm, I'm certain I was the strongest. And this must have done so much for you around now for the rest of this year. Yeah, well I know I've trained hard this winter. My only problem has been my weight, not fat weight. <laughs> I did a lot of cross country skiing this winter and I, I had incredibly big arms for cyclists and a big back. And uh, I'm just slowly in the last two, three weeks, I felt myself lose one kilo. I, I know I lost one kilo just the last two, three weeks. And I've had, had difficulty in the early season on the climbs, but I knew in Perrier Bay it was, my power was very good. And I knew I had a chance. Greg, super. Well done. All right. Okay. I got to go to the shower. <laughs> <laughs>
The applause will go on for hours, I'm sure, and the old velodrome here at Roubaix hasn't seen anything quite like it in 90 Paris Roubaix. Gilbert Duclos Lazal, the oldest man in the race, is the winner today, and above all, he's French, and he won so well, didn't he? But what about Greg Lamond? Greg Lamond now can look forward to this summer's Tour de France. Greg Lamond, I think, is back in the big time. You can follow the Tour de France and Greg and Duclos Lazal, of course, with FCV this summer, but for now, from me, Phil Liggett, it's goodbye.